morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Sandy Kelly, Associate Director in the Office of Admission at Ithaca College. And I am going to share my screen and do a brief presentation. Um, I'm gonna go through that quite quickly because I feel like you know, some of you may have already done some investigation and know some of these things, but I just wanna kind of give an overview. And we're gonna save quite a bit of time at the end for questions and answers. And uh, Hamadri and Hazel will um, join me at the end, introduce themselves and then answer your questions and particularly give the student perspective, which I think is the, sometimes the most important. So to begin, I do wanna acknowledge that we're in unprecedented times right now with the global pandemic. Ithaca College made the decision to not have most students come back to campus this fall. And so we are almost exclusively going, have been going virtual for the fall semester. And it's not the way we wish it would be because our campus life and seeing the students each day is so important, is such an important part of Ithaca College. Um, but we felt it was in the best interests of the entire community. So there's a lot of detail about how Ithaca College has responded to uh, COVID-19 on our website, and I put the URL there, and we can talk a little bit about it in the question and answer if you have questions. We are planning to have um, an option to come back to campus for spring semester, and some students will continue virtually and others will come back to campus. Um, of course, we're monitoring the situation and may have to adapt plans depending on the circumstances. So let's get started. So uh, Ithaca College is located in Ithaca, New York. We're in the central part of New York State in what's called the Finger Lakes area, about an hour south of Syracuse and about four hours uh, northwest of New York City. It's a beautiful area. Um, the, we have 150 waterfalls within the area. There are state parks. We have a vibrant uh, downtown, what's called the Commons area, which has a lot of restaurants, some shops. So we're a small community, but um, really interesting community because in addition to our campus, Cornell University is located in Ithaca, New York. So it's a very college town. There are people from all over the world coming to Ithaca. And then Ithaca College was founded in 1892 as the Ithaca Conservatory of Music. In the mid 20th century, we expanded to go beyond the music conservatory. And we now um, are a full comprehensive uh, college, which uh, sits right adjacent to the city. So it's on the edge, just about a mile from the downtown uh, Commons area and about two miles from Cornell University. Um, our students come from around the world and here's a map that kind of demonstrates our international student by uh, country of citizenship. So it's quite diverse and brings an amazing multicultural aspect to the campus. So for academics, we have a wide range of academic programs. We have uh, more than 90 academic majors. They are organized into five schools, which is the School of Business, the Park School of Communications, the School of Health Science and Human Performance, the School of Humanities and Sciences, and the School of Music. So that's a really amazing grouping of programs. One of my challenges all the time is to give proper uh, focus to any one of those 90 majors. So if you feel like we haven't covered it, I can provide more information on the other majors available. And I do wanna point out the students often take courses or do a major in one area, and then they take classes, they may do what's called a minor or even double major in another area. So we really encourage students to take advantage of all of the options um, at Ithaca College. We have a small class size, our average class size is 17. So the experience in the classroom is one where students are engaged in learning and really actively participating in the classroom. 
Student life is key. We have about 6,000 undergraduate students. And so it is, we say not too big, not too small. It's big enough that uh, students are constantly meeting new student, new friends and um, uh, students throughout their four years of study, but you're also always gonna see your friends when you're on campus because we are a community. Um, if from the domestic students, students come from all over the United States with the majority coming from outside of uh, New York State. So it is a campus where students are living on campus primarily, and that creates a environment where it's home and it's community. It's not simply a place where students go to school class and then they leave. And there's a lot of things to do at Ithaca College. We have 200 student organizations and clubs, more than 200. We have athletics at, at competitive levels or recreational levels. There's music performances um, that students can participate in or go to see. We have um, a lot of volunteer leadership honors kinds of organizations. We have uh, opportunities for students to apply what they're learning outside the classroom. That might be in research laboratories, in our student media, in uh, the theater and performance spaces, the clinical health sciences area. So there's a lot of opportunity for students to get practical experience even while they're um, studying at Ithaca College. And because we're a community, we pro provide the kind of support that um, students would need uh, throughout their, uh, their week or their day at Ithaca College. And the health and well being of our students is the most important aspect. So we have lots of academic support. To, if students need a little extra help writing, getting feedback on papers, or if they need some assistance in terms of accessibility, there's a uh, academic advising, both with uh, advising in the advising centers, but also with faculty. We have health, physical health, and counseling services available to support students if they uh, need those um, services. And then we have a fitness center and recreational areas for students to stay active and engaged. Um, in terms of employment, a lot of our students do work on campus. So it gives an opportunity, of course, to earn some money, but also to be engaged in the campus and to start building a resume of skills. And then we have a lot of opportunities for students to connect with other students um, that may be in different academic areas or live in different um, areas of the residence halls, but share a common um, connection so that they can feel part of the larger group. And for international students, we do provide a lot of support um, specifically because we know the um, experience and the needs of international students are different than for uh, students from the uh, US. And students can kind of take advantage and use these services as much as uh, they need and feel um, is important to them. So we do have an international student advisor and she works with students who uh, are coming to the US and one important aspect of her uh, responsibilities is international student or orientation. And so in a, when students begin at the college, there are specific areas of orientation that an international student would participate in. If a student's on an F-1 visa, some of that re, um, refers to the uh, regulations and the requirements um, and that are needed to understand what is uh, required of a student on an F-1 visa. And that can sometimes get confusing if you don't have that support. And Deanna Dimitrova is our student advisor and she will make sure that everybody understands what they need to do on the F-1 visa. We have um, peer advisors. 
so international students support one another uh, as they're going through the process to so that you know you have uh, someone who's going who's um, experienced some of the same things that you have in terms of the transition or being so far away from home or connecting um, to other international students. And then there's cultural programming. So there's a lot, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of programming for all of our students and the international student uh, organizations do amazing programming. One of the recent ones was a, a big event in the fall for our international student club is the One World concert. And of course, we couldn't have it in person this year. So the International Student Club organized it and you can see it on Google, if, or I'm sorry, YouTube. If you um, Google in, uh, Ithaca College One World Concert and you'll see the amazing um, talent and the uh, creativity that they put together a virtual concert. So I'm going to talk real briefly about the application process because we'll guide you through it. Uh, we do require the common application. So if you're going to apply to a program, uh, submit the common application. We are and have been test optional since 2012. So it's really up to you. You can choose if you want to submit standardized test scores with your application. If you say, no, I'm not going to submit them, that's fine. You can still be connect, um, considered for all majors and all um, uh, scholarship programs. So you, it's fine with us if you do not submit those scores. Um, and then, so you submit your transcript and your recommendation and uh, your application. I do want to just make one caveat, which is if you're applying to one of our performance-based programs, theater or music in those areas, there are some additional requirements. And then if that's your interest, if you're going to apply directly to a major in school of music or your department of theater, I'll need you to reach out to me and get some additional information. Um, and then in order to be considered for the scholarship and financial support, you'll need to submit the CIS, CSS profile. And again, this is all linked on our website and we can take you through it. And a reminder, the application uh, deadline for consideration for the next Genius Scholarship is December 15th. There's a lot of ways to get additional information once you um, after this, there's a lot of virtual contact, including a virtual college tour, some videos that show you the campus in um, a more visual way. We have sessions, um, virtual sessions that are live. We have recorded sessions. So there's a lot of opportunity to learn more information. And then we'll talk a little bit more about um, the opportunity, the requirement to have an interview as part of the scholarship. But if you do want to have an information session with me ahead of time, just for more information, not as part of the scholarship consideration, it's not required, but you can either email me or schedule an appointment with me. All right, so I'm going to ask Himadri and then Hazel to come on camera and uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the their experience. Madri, would you start? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm really sorry if you hear noise in the background. It was just unavoidable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, hey guys, I'm Madri Se. I'm from New Delhi. And uh, my major, I, I currently have two majors. So I'm a documentary studies and production major and an economics major. Um, and so let me talk about one thing that I love the most about IC, and I would say that is how much support um, the professors and also other students give to you. 
Um, so like you could literally go up to any professor in any of your classes and the chances are that most of them will understand you if you have any problems. And even in student clubs, uh, you know, your seniors and people that you work with are very collaborative, they're very understanding, very supportive. So I would say that that is the best part of my experience in IC is that I always feel like there is someone that I can go to and that I, I don't feel like I need to sort of, um, you know, like go through things alone and that, um, yeah, yeah, I think I would say that's mine. Do you want to go next, Hazel? Hey, everyone. Um, I was an ex-junior scholar for the last year. Uh, and currently I'm a communication management and design major uh, at Ithaca. I'm a freshman, still at my first semester, but um, right. So I'll start with, I guess, how it's been online, um, which is obviously super different from Himadhi's experience um, of her first term. But I feel like, you know, um, I feel the same way that the professors like were really supportive like during this time especially so um like I can only imagine how supportive they are in class and then on campus um you know sometimes like especially with time zones if you have problems you they always like grant you leeway so they're very understanding um another thing that I love um I mean, that's like, that's one thing that I've just, I've just really enjoyed um, classes and the professors who, who are, you know, relatable, even if, well, obviously like they're, um, you know, from like, it's a different culture, it's a different age group, but they, they, it is so easy to relate to them and to talk to them and they are so approachable. Um, so that's one of my favorite things. Um, about college right now and I'm gonna have like so much more to say on campus but you guys will probably also join me there so yeah <laughs> um I'm, I guess I'm not sure what else to say uh except that um I really hope um you guys uh read more about it and will also come to love it as much as Himadri and I do Great, thank you, Hamadri and Hazel. I do um, want to point out that Hazel had the um, most recent experience, which meant that she had to do orientation virtually, took some courses in the summer virtually, as well as her first semester. So that's, again, a very different experience than we normally would want to have, and we hope to come back to the experience that was more like Hamadri's experience when she started. But, and um, I really appreciate it because Hazel submitted an op-ed piece for the Ithacan, the student newspaper, which talked about the challenges of doing um, virtual uh, learning when you're in a different time zone, you're trying to connect. So we definitely understand that um, this is, uh, an experience that we, again, we don't necessarily want, but we really appreciate that it's also giving everybody, uh, all of us, uh, uh, an opportunity to take a look at how things are done, do some improvements, and maybe have some more experiences that way. So I'm gonna, we're gonna move into your questions, um, and I encourage you to um, unmute, come on screen, to answer, to ask your questions or to put them in the chat. And we'll be happy to um, take any questions um, that you might have. Is anybody brave enough to ask the first question? I know it's always intimidating. Um, my question is how would you say the transition between like Delhi or like a larger city in India is compared to like going to Ithaca, which I know is like slightly smaller. Um, it's a lot smaller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I wouldn't say that it's entirely easy because it's not because you come from a city that's so big and there's people everywhere. Um, and, you know, you sort of go into their, this place and like the most people they have at any time is like the least people we have at any time. 
which can be in the beginning it can be a little surprising and not something you're used to but as you spend more time there and you get to know people i think it can be comforting in a weird way because um like you haven't sort of seen that kind of quiet and been in a small place ever before and now you sort of have the chance to be in a place where there's so much of like natural beauty and you can sort of sit in the quiet and think <laughs> Yeah, I also moved from a bigger city, Tampa, Florida, to Ithaca, New York. And so, um, you know, I've come to appreciate the, uh, what sometimes can feel odd, you know, sometimes you're like, it's so quiet and maybe, you know, it's so dark at night because you can see the stars and that kind of thing. And then, um, so that at first is a little alarming um, when you're used to living in a more urban area, but then you get to appreciate those things. And, you know, I always struggle a little bit to how to describe Ithaca because it, it is small. We have about 100,000 people who live in the, the larger community within a 10 mile area. Um, but again, because we have so much, so many students between the two campuses, there's 25,000 students coming from around the world. So our population increases on a normal year of about 25% that it has, um, things that you wouldn't necessarily uh, get in a smaller town. And um, it has influences um, that you wouldn't necessarily get from the diversity of the people coming here. And so, you know, I think of it sometimes as a, if you think of it as a neighborhood within a bigger city, that kind of feel. And it has probably everything you need, but it doesn't have the, the choices of everything that you might want. So you, you know, we have the stores and the restaurants where you can get things that are needed, but definitely not a big city um, feeling. Great, yeah. thank you for that question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go That's ahead. Right, Himadri, go ahead. Oh yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Like it doesn't, for me, it never felt like there was anything that I couldn't get in Ithaca, like in terms of stores and restaurants, it's, it's pretty diverse. And we have two Indian restaurants too, which are pretty good. So you guys can try those out when you uh, come there. But yeah, I think like my only thing was that it, it, it was just like so sudden. But I would say, I would still say that I, you probably wouldn't fa feel like you can't, you can't get anything there. And Ithaca also has a very great history if you ever get to like exploring that and going to the like Tompkins County History Center, which has great people. So like once you really get into it, there's a lot to explore. Great, so who else has a question? Um, hi, so I had a question regarding some portfolios. I understand that it's not a requirement for any of the major, but um, we do have an option if we would like to submit a portfolio. I'm just not very sure about the process of doing the same. So I'll answer that. Um, no, we don't require portfolios for our BFA um, majors. And, you know, there's some discussion sometimes about whether that's a good way to go or a bad way to go. The reason we don't require it is because um, not every applicant has the same opportunity, access to resources to develop a portfolio. And sometimes that can be quite expensive and requires equipment that not every student has, particularly if you're talking about film. Um, and so we don't want to disadvantage students who haven't had the, those opportunities. Another reason is um, some areas, film would be an example. Um, it's, a, it's it by nature is a cooperative kind of medium. And sometimes in a portfolio submission, it's hard to know exactly what was contributed or what was done. And so, you know, that also. The other reason is that we don't think that by the time a student is 17 or 18, that they've really 
you know, done what, you know, should be evaluated, that part of coming is to start out and go through the process. And so we find it works well. We, in the application, if you have experience producing art, you know, that's related, whether it be film or um, painting, uh, that you can, um, that we want to see that. So it helps if you've had that opportunity to list that in your application, but we're not going to evaluate what you've done. So, you know, we're not going to say submit a film and we're going to evaluate it. Um, so I hope that helps. And then if you want, if you would like some feedback, what you can do is submit a link or a, um, a, uh, to the admission will be added to your file. And again, it'll be noted, but again, we're not going to require it so that we ev evaluate it. Did I answer that question, Didi? Um, yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you. What other questions do people have? I had a question. Hi. I'm, oh, sorry. Do you want to go ahead? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Anya. I'll be applying to the BM in Jazz Studies. And um, I wanted to ask about the audition process because I saw on the website that we choose between a virtual live audition and a recorded audition. Um, and I wanted to, I, I know the, the virtual live audition is preferred, but I wanted to ask if submitting a recorded audition would be like a substantial um, sort of, would it substantially hinder my, my application because, you know, there are time zone differences and technological difficulties. And so I wanted to ask about that. No, I think you should feel comfortable, particularly for given, you know, that you're um, auditioning from afar, that you can go ahead and upload. I do want to point out, though, for again, for music and theater, we really want you to complete the application process by December 1st not the 15th. So, um, and that includes both submitting the application and completing the audition requirements. So, so no, you should feel great. We completely understand the, um, the challenges that are in place, particularly for this year. And we've always had the video audition option for international students, you know, even before, so. Okay, okay and I think I saw, is it kind of? who had a question yeah. yeah so hi everybody my name is kano and uh, so my question is basically related to the application process so, uh, do ithaca college accept a duolingo test and is there any benchmark set for it so yes we do accept the duolingo um exam so and um we also depending on what your curricula is, we don't necessarily require um, English proficiency from uh, students from India. So if you're if you're in um, a curriculum that is taught primarily in English, and we can demonstrate that it is an, a full English curriculum, we will not require it. If you have an SAT verbal of above 600, if you're taking IB courses. So if we have another exam that can, you know, we can substantiate that you're able to succeed in English language curricula, we don't uh, require it. And I'm gonna go on our website and look at our suggested minimum score for Duolingo because I cannot remember it. So just give me. One second. Because we, we do accept four different English proficiency exams. So Duolingo, we have a recommended score of 105 or higher. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, my name is Shaila. I, even I had a question. 
Yeah. So even I will be applying for the music program and uh, I was in contact with Professor Wall and uh, she has been helping me with the auditions as well. So I just wanted to ask, I had this doubt that I could complete my uh, audition uh, application by December 1st, but I could submit my other, the, my whole application by December 14th, is that right? So for music, we the technically for those who require audition, we really want you to try to get everything done by December 1st. It can, you know, we can give a little bit of leeway, make sure you get your application for admission in, make sure you start your audition application um, before December 1st, and then stay in touch with representatives from the School of Music. So I'll have to be like, I'll have to be done with it before December, December 1st, is that right? Make sure you submit your application for admission by December 1st okay. and uh, do the accepted application, you know, start that process. You, there's a little bit of leeway for getting everything's finished beyond, you know, probably to the December 15th. The earlier, though, you can get it, the better. They start reviewing those. So I, the School of Music is going to be a little bit more lenient than the Department of Theater about the December 1st deadline. So that's why I'm being a little bit, you know, wishy-washy about it. If you're applying to the, the acting and the uh, musical theater programs, the December 1st is a pretty hard deadline but the School of Music has a little bit more flexibility. So as long as they know you're going to apply and you're working actively to get things done, you will be fine by December 15th. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Who else has a question? Hello. Hello, Devakama. Hey, Sandy. Hello. It's good oh, to see you. Hi. Um, I have a question mainly for uh, the alumni students. I want to basically ask how many international students are in your class? Nice question. Uh, I can, Himadi, do you want to go first? <laughs> you, can, you can take this one or we can both answer either way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, no, like I was just going to say that um, uh, I think I only have um, well, one of my classes is really big. It's like 70 people. So I, I don't know everybody. So if there could be some international students there. Um, but I do not think I have, I have one international student, incidentally, someone from the Next Genius program <laughs> in one of my classes. But um, I don't think I have um, any international students. I'm an international student, if that counts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think. I, I know I have one international student, uh, one Chinese student in one of my classes. Um, and other than that, I'm trying to think. I, I think I don't have in any of my other classes. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I have one in one class. Yeah, so, I mean, oh, sorry. No, Go no, ahead, you can Hazel. Think it. it's okay. No, I was well, just I, just, I just want to provide some data. So we have, so this year is a challenging year um, in terms of international student enrollment. Several of our inter, uh, a significant, more than significant, more than normal number of students decided to defer their admission because of the virtual enrollment. So um, we did have a smaller group come in and we had um, even current students decide to take a leave of absence um, because of the challenges of, and for, for a wide variety of reasons, um, they were not able or did not want to do virtual learning. So, so they were either able to take a leave of absence. So that for Hazel's experience is a little, you know, might not be significantly different, but um, it's a little, hard sometimes to even know somebody's nationality when you're in a virtual unless you have that opportunity and you you know in the US so but overall we generally have just under 3% who are non US citizens so one of the things to be aware of when students or when um, institutions 
um, lists their international student population, they may be including a wide range of people in that. So we're primarily undergraduate. Um, it, it, sometimes schools have very large graduate student international. And so that looks like a huge amount, but they're, they're um, at the graduate level. The other thing is when we, the figures that I just quoted you are for students who do not have US citizenship or residency. So anybody, there are students on our campus who live their whole life outside the US, but have US citizenship. And so they're not in those numbers, but their experience is very international. So, you know, it's, it gets tricky sometimes what even, inter we, we talk about that all the time in our office. When you say international, what do you mean by that term? Do you mean what their citizenship is? where their home address is, where they went to high school. So those can be different numbers. Are they graduate or undergraduate? I actually have something to add. Um, I know like I have like the same question when I was applying to like Ithaca or like just colleges in general, because sometimes it, it may seem like comforting that, um, you know, that like, okay, when there's like a large population of international students that like, you know, um, it, it just it's more comfortable of an experience like you have someone to turn to but um, honestly I've come to realize that um, while it can be a really important criteria for a lot of people for me I, I started to discount it more and more mostly because um, it's a really big place college is huge even if it's like a medium size or a small college so like if you're going um, it's not necessary that you're going to have like so many international students in your class or even that you see on a day to day basis when you're going out for like when you're having lunch or something like that. Um, and this is what I've come to realize just from talking to like people in my classes. Um, so I would say that it's like totally like everyone's call like you can put as much weight on this as you want to. But personally, I started um, putting less and less weight on it because um like international students don't account for like diversity all the time you know obviously they do but then um i feel like with culture and things like that um you don't really have to worry that much so yeah that's just my two cents <laughs> yeah yeah i would i would agree with that and i would say that even within people who are u.s citizens there is a lot of diversity there are people who have had very different experiences from each other and you know you can really you can find a lot of um, people that you have surprisingly very similar interests to that have no not, no connection with your background whatsoever. And yeah, like other than that, even if you want to like um, express your cultural um, uh, selves or like your culture, there are spaces for you to do that. Like I just started a dance club this semester with students from Cornell and it's like a Bollywood dance club and we have so much fun. We have people we have people who are non-Indian who are like coming into our club and just having so much fun. So it's really like it's really what you go there and then you make of it. <laughs> Thank you. And um, another question I would like to ask uh, assuming you are in the senior year how many uh, international students have got their place placements in these states? Oh, I'm actually a sophomore. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure about that one, but it's like, it's not about placements really here. It's more about sort of like the connections that you make uh, while you're in college that can eventually sort of like, that's how you go into the job area. But, but the college definitely helps a lot with that. We have career services and we have like in the communication school, um, we have Spark in the first semester, which is very helpful. And they give you access to things like Handshake and they tell you how to make your LinkedIn profile. So you have a lot of support on that. So don't worry. Yeah, and I just add, you know, that um, students are different, you know, in terms of where they want to go where they want to uh, work. It could be in the States, it could be in their home country, it could be in another country. So, um, and so that, you know, we're gonna help the student. We can't, we don't place students. We don't tell students where they're going to work and do. Uh, 
we can support them in pursuing the education that they want. In terms of, you know, working in the US, you then you have an option to do what's called OPT, which is a, a, a year beyond on the student visa, a year, sometimes it depends on the program, sometimes uh, two or three to stay in the US and on your student visa and do additional uh, work. Then if you want to stay, you would have to uh, apply and receive a job from a company that will support a work visa. So there's things beyond the control, you know, of the college or even the student. And so those are things that um, a student's gonna need to navigate. So in terms of, again, what they're interested in and um, what the process will be. It can, as you probably realize, things change in the government quite quickly, um, and, you know, and, and attitudes and opportunities are going to change in four years time. We can't, I can't predict it. So I think what I would encourage students to think about is, Am I going to get the kind of experience that will be valuable regardless of where, you know, the opportunities are? Because I may change also in terms of where I want to wor um, uh, work when I'm done. So those that's, unfortunately, we can't predict what will happen in four years time in terms of uh, employment, work visas, that kind of thing. So, and we don't try to guarantee that. Most of our students after a year are either in graduate school or employed. So we know that from our surveys, but then it depends on what they wanted to do and how they pursued the opportunities. Also, um, like I know like at least some of you are applying for like the music programs or like jazz studies. Um, I was just gonna say that uh, if, you, if you look up there's a whole list of alumni, like famous alumni, that you, was probably really interesting. Um, maybe if you guys know Jeremy Jordan, he was on Supergirl, but he's also really famous on Broadway. He graduated from IC. So it's like a whole thing. You should definitely go check that out. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're looking to uh, apply in a communication school, you guys probably know Bob Iger. He is an Ithaca graduate. So this is all stuff you can find out on the website. <laughs> So I'm going to come back to a question that was submitted on the chat, which is uh, clubs for students who are POC. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that, Hazel, you entered that. So, so I thought that was a question. So yeah, we have, uh, as I mentioned, all kinds of student clubs. Um, and they can be uh, according to cultural or identity. Um, or they can be a mixture of things. One of my favorite examples of a co combination was um, the Ithaca College Gamer Symphony Orchestra. So for students who are interested in gaming and soundtrack of games, and um, they have a concert typically every year for ga uh, gaming music, and they want to elevate it. So, and they want to introduce symphony music too. So just to, you know, like some person probably thought they're the only people who are really interested in symphony music and gaming and they found other support people and they have a club that does some amazing things. So who else has a question? I had another, is mm -hmm. that okay? Yes, please. Oh, okay. I wanted to ask about performance opportunities as a jazz studies major. Um, you know, will I have the opportunity to have my music played um, or you know, to be helped with that? What, what are some? Yeah, so um, Anya, you kind of broke up, but I think I got the question, which is that uh, performance opportunities. So, uh, and this is true for students who are music majors or students who have a musical ability, which is um, there are about 300 recitals and concerts each year at Ithaca College. We have 
amazing performance spaces, a concert hall and a recital hall. And so um, there's those um, opportunities for students to audition into any ensemble, as well as be part of um, the sort of college-wide opportunities. And then also um, students do things on a sort of ad hoc basis. So we've had jazz uh, trios, uh, jazz quartets, who gig in the local community and um, take advantage of those opportunities. So our students, and you can normally on a spring day, you can go outside and hear people playing their music from the School of Music because it's right in the center of campus. So there's lots of opportunities. Yeah, there's also like, uh, we have a marketplace. Uh, it's called the Towers Marketplace. and. Uh, it's like where you, uh, wait, it's not called the market. I, I forgot, it's been so long since I've been on campus. But it's where you get all the good pizza, so it's the place to be. And they, uh, when I was there, they used to do like a jazz symphony performance that like everyone could just come to and like eat and drink and like watch every Thursday. So even if you just wanna look at things and if you're not part of the School of Music, these, these are things that you can experience. And of course, like concerts and everything that they have in the School of Music are something you can always attend regardless of what school you're in. So I wanted to, I know we're coming up to time, but I wanted to, um, we've talked quite a bit about some of our programs, as I mentioned earlier, this is, a challenge when we have such a wide range of programs that we have, you know, it's hard to go into detail. And so both, sort of by coincidence, both Hamadri and Hazel are communication students, and we do have the performing arts, but I don't want to give, um, ignore the opportunities for the STEM programs. And I put in the chat a URL to uh, interview that one of our students uh, international students, Antara Sen, uh, did uh, about her amazing opportunity, she's a physics major, and her amazing opportunity to do research with NASA, and she's a sophomore. So one of the great things about Ithaca College is we're primarily undergraduate focused. So that sometimes you're like, well, does that mean you're not as advanced because you don't offer a lot of graduate? degrees. Now, what I would say it does is it makes sure that the students studying their bachelor's degrees get opportunities that sometimes uh, are reserved for graduate students. And Antara is a, an amazing um, example of someone who pursue, took the opportunities that were available to her and did some amazing research with one of our faculty members who has a grant from NASA. And so she's now been in contact and doing the, the research that you can um, uh, view. So again, just because, you know, sometimes we're talking about specific areas and it's it, this melting pot of interest is a very integral part of what makes, I think, at the college special. Yeah, Andrea is one of my best friends. So this is very funny to hear, but yeah, mm -hmm. she's like, I've, I've been there with, like through her experience and when she came in like we, we both came in together and we were both like we came in and we were like okay we're doing this are we really doing this we were like so confused and then like I've seen how we've sort of like discovered the things that we want to do from there so I would say like college is the beginning of your like path to sort of learning it more about yourself and understanding yourself and exploring the world and it's that it's not an end goal Should we try to take one more question? Do we have time? Yes, yeah, sure, one more question. Okay, anybody got the last question? Nope. All right, so I'm gonna add, then ask Hamadri and Hazel just to, first of all, I wanna thank you so much. It's great to see everybody. We miss everybody on campus. I can't tell you how anxious I am to get back to seeing all the students on campus. Any last thoughts you wanna share?
All right. So I think uh, we've had amazing questions. Uh, thank you, Sandy, for such an informative and interactive session. It was great. And it was good to see the applicants on camera as well, because even we are not going to see them anytime soon. And thank you so much, Himadri and Hazel, for being great and amazing Next Genius Ithaca ambassadors. I've always heard them, you know, talk about Next Genius, but actually hearing them talking about Ithaca was an experience for me as well. So great things to learn on my side as well. And thank you once again to everyone and to all the applicants. Thank you.